It is November 1940. In the Mediterranean Sea, HMS Illustrious, escorted by cruisers and destroyers, navigated toward its launch point. Its radar detected Italian scouting planes' presence, but Italy's lack of radar spared the convoy. Aboard Illustrious, British pilots prepared 24 fairy swordfish, revered as the string bag, armed with torpedoes and bombs. Their mission was a quite daring and unprecedented one, an aerial assault on the fortified Italian Taranto anchorage where the marvels of the Italian fleet, six strong and imposing battleships, lay in wait. The raid on Taranto was about to begin, and it would be a turning point in naval military history. As the autumn of 1940 settled over the Mediterranean theater, there had been severe setbacks for the Italians. Several cruisers, torpedo boats, and destroyers were sunk at the Battle of Cape Spada and Passero. And the Giulio Cesare was stricken by a 15-inch shell from the British battleship Warspite at Calabria. Still, British apprehension persisted. Sure, they had successes, but the Italian Navy boasted a strong fleet of six battleships, including the sleek Vittorio Veneto and Littorio, alongside the Conte di Cavour, Giulio Cesare, Andrea Doria and Caio Duilio. What made these vessels exceptional was their combination of speed, armor, and firepower. Of their battleships, two were newly commissioned Littorio class ships, and four were older vessels recently rebuilt, belonging to the Cavour and Doria classes. The Cavour class ships, launched in 1911 and refitted in 1937, boasted 27 knot speed and 12 inch main guns, while the Doria class ships, launched in 1913, and refitted in 1939, had 10-inch steel armor and 13-inch main guns. The Littorio-class battleships, each displacing 45,000 tons and armed with triple turrets of 15-inch guns, were additionally equipped with numerous secondary and anti-aircraft guns. They generally fell short in terms of armor protection and overall operational effectiveness. Nonetheless, their presence posed a credible threat to Britain's vital convoys supplying the armies fighting in North Africa. Meanwhile, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini contemplated invading Greece amidst ongoing war. Initially secretive, he excluded German allies and the Italian Navy from early invasion plans. No matter naval reservations, Mussolini proceeded, deploying Italian naval forces for transport and landings. Facing logistical challenges, the Navy organized extensive transport across the Adriatic. Troop redirection from Corfu to Valona strained Albanian ports ill-equipped for the campaign's demands. Greece's opening of airfields to the British, coupled with Italian port congestion, resulted in nightly bombings. The British sought to reinforce Greece through the Mediterranean, necessitating the risky convoy route. To avoid engaging the concentrated Italian fleet, Admiral Andrew B. Cunningham resurrected a long-dormant plan dubbed Operation Judgment conceived in the mid-1930s to launch an aerial assault. The British Admiralty orchestrated a surprise torpedo attack aimed at neutralizing Italian battleships at the heavily fortified Taranto anchorage. The Italian Navy's modernized fleet and port defenses, including barrage balloons, anti-torpedo netting, anti-aircraft guns and powerful searchlights, made Taranto a difficult and risky target. Leading the charge was the aircraft carrier HMS Illustrious, accompanied by a strong task force of escorts, which set sail from Alexandria, Egypt, on November 6th. On the 10th of November, Illustrious, flanked by a screen of cruisers and destroyers under Rear Admiral Lumley St. George Lister, commenced the approach toward a launch point just west of the Greek island of Cephalonia. During their voyage, the radar picked up some signals from Italian scouting planes but because the Italians lacked radar, they overlooked the convoy entirely. Aboard Illustrious were 24 Fairy Swordfish torpedo bombers, affectionately known throughout the fleet air arm as the String Bag. Despite their antiquated appearance and sluggish performance, these biplanes packed a lethal punch with their over 1,500 pound torpedoes. Half of them carried torpedoes, while the other half carried bombs and flares. These flares were meant to illuminate the battleships lying in the harbor for the other torpedo bombers. Taranto Harbor was protected by an intimidating ring of over 240 anti-aircraft guns, leading to some severe doubts among the British Admiralty that these 24 swordfish weren't enough to cripple the enemy fleet. 
At 8.30 p.m. on November 11th, Illustrious maneuvered into position, bracing to unleash two waves of swordfish. The first wave, comprising 12 aircraft commanded by Lieutenant Commander Kenneth Williamson, took flight. During their journey, four aircraft veered off course, enveloped by dense clouds. They lost contact with Williamson's main formation. With no means of communication between planes, Williamson hoped the missing swordfish was still en route to Taranto. Then, Illustrious dispatched the second wave of nine swordfish under the command of Lieutenant Commander John Ginger Hale. The first seven aircraft took off without any issues, but a collision between the 8th and 9th led to both being unable to participate in the raid. The attack had not even begun, and the force had already lost two of its aircraft. The first swordfish group was expected to arrive at Taranto by 11 p.m., but an hour before, there was already consternation in the dimly lit harbour. A diaphone picked up the sound of a distant plane. The alarm sounded in the harbour as soldiers took their positions and civilians hid in air raid shelters. Some random shots were fired into the darkness without a clear target. By 10.45, a single swordfish, commanded by Lieutenant Swain, unexpectedly reached Taranto, outpacing the rest of the formation by 15 minutes. He circled for a bit, waiting for his comrades to arrive, realizing the element of surprise was long gone. Sporadic gunfire, tracer shells and light flashes were fired at non-existent targets from the ground. Then, the remainder of the first squadron arrived. Two planes dropping flares along the northeast shore of the Mar Grande provided an illuminated flight path before dive-bombing against an oil depot in the harbor. The startled Italian anti-aircraft gunners sprang into action unleashing a relentless barrage of shells into the night sky and sounding the alarm as their tracers streaked overhead. As the clock struck 11 p.m., British flares pierced the darkness, casting an eerie glow over the expanse of Taranto Harbour. The torpedo bombers commenced their runs towards their designated targets. They divided into four groups of three swordfish. As the rest of the first wave joined Lieutenant Swain, any element of surprise vanished with Taranto fully alert. Torpedo planes dove into the fray as they braved anti-aircraft fire. Lieutenant Commander Williamson flew into the harbor while being shot at by anti-aircraft guns and destroyers as he released its payload before being shot down. Williamson and his observer survived and were taken prisoner by the Italians. His torpedo sped toward the full mine. However, it missed the ship narrowly before crashing into the mighty Conti di Cavour between the bridge and B turret. It blasted an eight-meter-wide hole in her hull. The crippled battleship began sinking as water rapidly entered the ship. The next two swordfish, suffering the same barrage of fire as Williamson, missed the Cavour. Instead, the torpedoes exploded a few miles further down near the Doria, but the damage was negligible. Undeterred by the barrage of enemy fire, the next swordfish pressed on, skimming perilously close to the water's surface. As it flew over San Pietro Island, hostile gunners unleashed their fury from all directions. It veered sharply to maneuver between Taranto and a line of anchored cruisers, as the cruisers responded with a relentless barrage, their heavy shells raining down close to the harbor's merchant ships. Drawing nearer to his target, the pilot spotted the imposing silhouette of the Littorio illuminated by flares. He maintained his course until reaching 1,000 yards from the enemy battleship, dropping his torpedo and ascending. His torpedo found its mark, ripping a gaping hole in the Littorio's starboard bow. Following closely behind, Lieutenant Swain braved a different approach. Flying low and fast, he skirted the northern tip of the breakwater, dodging tracer fire as he closed in on the battleship from the opposite direction. Swain released his torpedo a mere 350 meters from the target before joining the other swordfish in the safety of open waters. His torpedo struck the Littorio's port quarter, further crippling the mighty vessel. The final torpedo-armed swordfish of the first wave piloted by Lieutenant Maund maneuvered through tracer fire. He approached his target area from the northwest. As he descended, he narrowly avoided enemy vessels, likely receiving fire from the Veneto utilizing other ships as cover. His torpedo missed the intended target, harmlessly detonating off the Littorio's starboard quarter. Three more swordfish then attempted bombing runs. 
One hit a seaplane base, causing a large explosion. Another one landed a bomb on a destroyer, but it failed to explode, and the third missed entirely. Despite the heavy fire, so far only one plane had been lost. With the first wave of attack done, a brief lull ensued. Hale and the remaining seven planes arrived roughly 90 minutes later, while the Italians were still on high alert. The two Vanguard swordfish dropped flares to illuminate the harbour. Then, they launched an attack on the oil storage depots, igniting a fire. Despite the heavy barrage of anti-aircraft fire, they didn't sustain damage. The five remaining aircraft, each carrying a torpedo, targeted battleships in the harbour. Hale executed a daring dive and successfully struck the Littorio with his torpedo, tearing a 12 by 12 meter gap in its hull. Another aircraft was lost, shot down near the cruiser Gorizia, with the pilot's body recovered the next day and his observer never found. Despite the heavy flak, a swordfish successfully targeted the Cayo Duilio with his torpedo. It hit the ship's starboard side, causing an enormous hole. The crew tried its best to prevent the ship from sinking, sailing to the shore, listing heavily as water poured in and the Zara and Fiume around it continued their firing. Lieutenant Torren Spencer's swordfish faced intense anti-aircraft fire as he approached his target, likely the Veneto. His torpedo either missed or malfunctioned. Another pilot, Wellam, encountered difficulties when his aircraft was hit, causing a jam in the controls. He did manage to regain partial control through unconventional maneuvers. He launched his torpedo against the Duilio, which missed. Once again, his plane was hit. With severe damage, he somehow made it back to the illustrious, flying 100 miles with damage which would generally have brought down an aircraft. The last swordfish, flown by Lieutenant Clifford, arrived at Taranto slightly behind schedule. He targeted the cruiser Trento with his bombs. One bomb hit the Trento, punching a hole in its deck but failing to detonate. The remainder were dropped around the ship. As Clifford departed, the raid on Taranto was over. As the last British plane veered homeward towards Illustrious, the Littorio listed in the water, Cayo Duilio awaited extensive repairs, and the Conte di Cavour lay beached. The cruiser Trento too bore the scars of battle. The Littoria was knocked out of the war for four months, the Duilio for six, and the Cavour for the entire war. In a matter of minutes, the scales of naval power in the Mediterranean had irreversibly tipped in favour of the Royal Navy. Remarkably, the British achieved this with minimal losses, losing only two swordfish aircraft and two airmen in the process, contrasting with Italian casualties, 23 on the Littorio, 16 on the Conte di Cavour, and one on the Duilio. The devastating attack significantly crippled Italy's battleships, reducing their number from six to only two, Vittorio Veneto and Giulio Cesare, both escaping relatively unscathed. The aerial strike on the Regia Marina's anchorage at Taranto sent shockwaves through the Italian naval hierarchy. The strike is considered a turning point in naval warfare, showing the supremacy of aircraft carriers. The precision of the attack instilled a deep-seated reluctance within the Italian naval establishment to risk their capital ships in further engagements. Ironically, across the vast expanse of the Pacific, the leaders of the Imperial Japanese Navy took note of the events at Taranto with keen interest. Emboldened by the success of the British raid, they would soon set their sights on their own audacious plan of attack, one that would forever alter the course of history. A year later, the world would witness the devastating consequences of their actions at Pearl Harbor. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please leave a like, it really helps out the channel. If there is a topic, battle or person you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 per month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.